Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar titled Unlocking Cape Breton's Geothermal Potential, Opportunities and Challenges. My name is Chris White, and I've been volunteering as chair of NSCN's board of directors for the past six years. I'm also joined by one of my fellow board members, Emily Loggy, who will be helping co-host tonight. The Nova Scotia Environmental Network is a nonprofit organization founded in 1991 to serve as an interconnecting body between environmental groups, governments, and the general public. Our mission is to support and empower Nova Scotia's environmental community by facilitating communication, collaboration, education, and volunteerism. We are currently built around a membership of 45 mental environmental groups across the province, as well as dozens of individual members and thousands of indirect member supporters and followers. We're part of a broader collection of provincial environmental networks connected through the Canadian Environmental Network. While we are the Nova Scotia Environmental Network, we do recognize that we are currently, what we currently know as Nova Scotia is actually just a segment of greater Mi'kmaq territory where the Mi'kmaq people have cared for the land, water, and air since time immemorial. This territory in which we live was never ceded nor surrendered when the Mi'kmaq signed peace and friendship treaties with the British in the 1700s. The treaties instead established rules for an ongoing relationship between sovereign nations, and they still apply to everyone living here today, regardless of your nationality. We believe indigenous voices and perspectives are critical to the environmental movement, and we've been honored to work with Mi'kmaq groups in our efforts to build bridges and educate the public on sustainability. For tonight's webinar, it will include a 30 minute presentation followed by a Q&A session wrapping up by 8 p.m. at the latest. The presentation will be delivered by our guest speakers from Net Zero Atlantic. We're very pleased to welcome Rupinder and Joe. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Rupinder Carr it works with Net Zero Atlantic through the Vershuren Center as a community outreach coordinator. Rupinder will deliver Net Zero Atlantic's GeoCat Thermal Capacity Building Assessment and Training Program focused on Nova Scotia's geothermal potential and examining community perceptions of this technology. She has developed a base knowledge of geothermal technology since she joined this project. Rupinda recently graduated from Cape Breton University with a Bachelor of Engineering Technology, specializing in petroleum and geosciences, and has two years of prior experience in the oil and gas sector. Joe Collier is managing Net Zero Atlantic's geothermal capacity building project, which aims to identify opportunities and outline measures to address challenges for Nova Scotian communities with mid-depth geothermal resource potential. Joe has over five years of project management experience supporting renewable energy applied research in Canada's territories and Atlantic Canada. He holds a Master of Science in Forestry from the University of New Brunswick and a BA in English Literature from the University of Ottawa. He's also a certified project management professional. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ender and I'll sure. share the screen here. Well, thank you, Chris, for a wonderful introduction. Um, welcome, everyone, for Net Zero Atlantic's GeoCAD session today. And thank you for joining the session. We are thrilled to have you all with us today. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm, I'm Rupinder. I'm based out in Sydney. I'm Community Outreach Coordinator for Net Zero Atlantic's GeoCAD project, which is Geothermal Resource Capacity Building Assessment and Training Program. So our goal is to kind of educate community specifically in Cape Breton about this technology and to spread this word out in communities so that we can take perception from communities, how they think about this technology and how they envision this coming to Cape Breton and to really educate them about geothermal energy and different types of it and its uses and, and its applications. So. We will delve into the presentation, but before that, I would like to introduce Joe Collier. He is the project manager of this project. Um, he's been managing this since uh, last year, July, since I joined this opportunity. Um, he has done a great job mentoring me and other community leads uh, for the project. So he will be going over Net Zero Atlantic, which is the next slide. Um, he will be going over introduction to Net Zero Atlantic, like who we are, 
and what we do and what is the project and how we have developed it. And Joe can take over. Hey, thanks, Rupinda, for uh, that really nice introduction. Uh, I'll keep it brief as you and Chris have both introduced me. I'm uh, Joe Collier, a project manager with Net Zero Atlantic. For those of you uh, who aren't aware of Net Zero Atlantic, Net Zero Atlantic is uh, a not-for-profit organization uh, based out of Halifax in Nova Scotia uh, that works through both applied research and project management to support Atlantic Canada's energy transition. Um, in terms of geothermal energy, uh, we're primarily doing this by addressing knowledge gaps that are faced throughout the region, whether it's by um, feasibility or uh, other studies examining geothermal potential, or in the case of this uh, project, uh, a capacity building and assessment program, which is funded by Natural Resource Canada, Natural Resource Canada's Smart Renewables and Electrification Pathway Program. Um, I think that's probably good for my intro. I'll pass it back to you, Rupinder. Thank you, Joe, for setting up the stage and a great introduction to Natsu Atlantic. So now moving on towards the next slide, we have a goal with us, which is, as I previously mentioned, to educate communities, um, specifically of k Britain community, to educate them about this geothermal technology and how this um, geothermal technology could be used towards heating and cooling purposes and specifically how Cape Breton carries potential within itself. And with moving on towards the next slide, I will showcase what key contents I will be going over during my presentation. Um, what, are, what is actually geothermal energy? What are different types of it? And what are some use cases and applications and how we can use geothermal technology in different sectors or different areas such as agricultural greenhouses? Um, what are some costs associated with it? What are some like economic and financial side of it? Um, how much is the potential of K Britain in terms of geothermal? I will be showcasing some maps uh, and evaluated studies um, and the projects that's already existing in Nova Scotia and K Britain as well. Um, that's somewhat similar to K, uh, somewhat similar to geothermal energy. Um, some existing examples of it. And with conclusion, I will share some contact details, how everyone can get involved with us and the project. With that being said, I will talk about what is actually geothermal energy is. It's the energy that we harness from Earth's surface um, as Earth have different layers. So that energy we harness from Earth's mental layer to the surface to use it to a different application, as we can see from the diagram here, we have different temperature ranges, uh, starting from like 10 degrees Celsius to over 150 degrees Celsius. And as we can see, as yes, the temperature changes and the application side of geothermal energy also changes. Uh, for the lower temperature, we can see we can use it towards agriculture or geothermal heat pumps or greenhouse heating and for green, uh, for the agriculture purposes. And for the higher temperatures, we can use it towards power generation or electricity generation. So it has like different applications to it, but it all depends on the temperature gradient, which means how much degree Celsius is present um, on that surface, which means every surface is different. Every surface has different geothermal gradient, as we can see in the, temp uh, in the diagram here. As we move deeper and deeper down, we have different temperature ranges. As we move um, away from like one kilometer to two kilometers, we have different gradients. For example, um, in Cape Breton, we have Sydney River. It has different geothermal gradient and Glace Bay may be having a different geothermal gradient. So it, it goes on like that. Um, and geothermal has a year round idle demand, which means um, customers like aquacultures or greenhouse, if they have an ideal energy demand over the years. So that means they are perfect customer for geothermal energy. With that, um, moving on to the next slide, we have a science behind geothermal energy, like how 
we have to understand like how this energy is getting generated. But before that, we have to understand what is the process of conduction here. So conduction means nothing but the movement or, or the transfer of heat energy from the hotter surface to the cooler surface. As we can see in the diagram here, uh, as the rainwater is getting collected in the aquifer or the water body over the surface. So um, the geothermal energy that is coming from the crust layer or the mantle layer, it's it's harnessing the heat energy towards the aquifer and heat energy is moving towards it and it's providing heat energy to the aquifer. So this water body that is present over the layer, it's getting heated up um, to certain temperature. As I mentioned in the previous diagram, it could be 10 degrees Celsius. It could be higher than that, depending on the gradient. And that uh, heated water could be retrieved at the surface. Um, so to retrieve that, we have different systems that I will discuss in the next slide. So with this diagram at the left, we can see there are like different systems, how we can retrieve geothermal system at the surface. We have open loop system, we have mid depth potential. Now I will start left of the diagram here that says open loop GSHP system, which means um, drawing up the surface water, drawing up the water to the surface with the open loop piping system which means directly like having contact with the groundwater to uh, get the heat energy to the surface to use it towards different applications like commercial or residential heating. Um, and we have a similar concept that is closed loop GSHP array, which is a similar concept to open loop, but in terms of uh, closed loop, we are using boreholes instead of like open piping system, which means um, instead of like directly drawing up water to the surface, we are uh, using boreholes, which is getting heated up by this water. And it's like drawing heating energy at the surface. So we can like generally compare the temperature here is 10 to 14 degrees Celsius, which is lower than the open loop system, which means um, the heating energy that we can get with the help of boreholes is not exactly uh, similar to the heat energy that we are directly getting from the like drawing up the water directly to the surface. So that means like temperature and efficiency is lower in case of closed loop system. But we already know like in Nova Scotia, we have um, surface groundwater contamination regulations. So this project is not focusing much on like open loop GSHP array, but instead of um, closed loop. So Moving on towards the third method, which is mine water heating energy. As the name suggests, like if any mine is left abandoned or it's open, so any rainwater can get collected in that aquifer and that water is getting heated up by the rocks that's around that mine water. And that heated up could be drawn to the surface to use it towards different applications. And as the number suggests, it's 25 degrees Celsius, which means it's pretty higher than um, the previous two systems that is open loop and closed loop system. Um, so we have like in Nova Scotia, we have a coal mining history. So there is a mining heating potential in terms of geothermal energy. Um, now, if we talk about mid-depth potential, this is our project focus, which means um, getting heat energy at the surface around 2,000 to somewhere around 5,000 meters. Um, temperature for like greater than 60 degrees Celsius to use towards like district heating and another commercial heating purposes. But as the, the name suggests, uh, this is mid-depth potential, which means like um, getting to like 5,000 meters range. Um, to get pretty higher temperature than the previous three systems, like 60 degrees Celsius. And I will move on towards, like, last but not least, that's the electricity generation method. It is um, pretty obvious, like, if we if you want to get higher temperatures, we have to fracture the rock um, to get, like, massive amount of heat energy. As the name suggests, this is green energy. At intrusion, granite means a massive amount of rock which contains massive heat energy inside it. 
And these kind of rocks generally lies in the crust layer of the earth. So they carry like greater than like 130 degrees Celsius of temperature we can see from the range here. And application are generally like power generation or electricity generation. And we call it enhanced geothermal system, which is like fracturing the rocks. So this is not our focus of the project. We are not talking about it because Nova Scotia is having conflicts against like fracturing and, uh, you know, breaking the rock uh, with the help of fracturing. So this is not a project focus, but the only focus is mid-depth potential, which uh, ranged like once a 60 degrees Celsius. With that, I will go over the next slide, which showcase um, different applications that how we can make use of geothermal energy towards different applications. I will start with the first diagram, which is greenhouse heating. Um, temperature ranges from like 40 to 80 degrees Celsius, which means it could be used towards like heating up space inside greenhouses um, or whether we can heat up or warm the water inside aquaculture or we can warm up the uh, soil towards agriculture uses or like green drying and food drying systems and temperature is pretty higher in that case um, we can use it towards like district heating network um, for commercial or residential heating as I mentioned before uh, for the mid-depth potential we have like hotels and spas and swimming pool which could which could like directly draw water to the surface or we can use like closed loop heating pump systems to um, draw the heat energy to use towards different applications. Um, now the next slide focuses on like what is actually geothermal usage in terms of agriculture. Um, so specifically, if we see at like 60 degrees Celsius range, it has like good applications in terms of um, agriculture uses. We can see um, it could be used towards agriculture, heat drying or like crop drying or grain drying or food processing or evaporation or like drying any kind of crops and warming up the soil or like heating up the space inside greenhouses or it could be used towards agri aquaculture heating. So like specifically in agriculture, geothermal carries so much, so much potential. Um, now the question here is in the next slide we have like why a geothermal system is different than other technologies and why geothermal is more reliable technologies than solar and wind technologies um so what happens in case of solar and wind it they all depend on like weather factors if there is sunlight outside only we can we can draw solar or like energy like wind energy, it's it. They depend on weather factors, but in terms of geothermal, um, I would say it's reliable and it's untouchable because it's underneath the surface and it's it's like untouchable. It's it's not depending on any any weather factors or external factors. So it's more reliable and independent of external factors. And the second reason is it's renewable. It's not going anywhere because it's it's underneath. It's available all the time, so it's space efficient. Also, uh, because it's just gonna use like feet squares rather than like laying down the solar panels on acres of lands and like, worrying about um, regulations and like space. So that is why the second major reason is it's renewable and it's twenty four by seven available and it's space efficient. And the last but not least is the operational and maintenance cost. Um, so geothermal energy are really efficient. Like if they are efficient, they are having low operational and maintenance cost, which means they doesn't require energy consumption. So if we take example of air source heat pump, um, they relies on like electric resistant backups, um, because they need like backup energy if they fail, um, during the season of snow season or like harsh weathers or like low, cold climates but in terms of geothermal energy we have we have like massive amount of heat energy that is like stored inside the earth's surface so we doesn't re need any uh, electric resistant backup or energy backup system so that is why it has low energy consumption which means the cost to maintain or to operate is very very low um with that being said moving towards the next slide 
what are some advantages of geothermal system over another technology? So as I mentioned, like it has low uh, maintenance cost and cost to operate is very low as it has energy consumption very, very lower than, uh, re than the rest of energy technologies like air source heat pump and ground source heat pumps. Um, we have water usage here, which means like we are not dumping water, which is drawn to the surface, to the open space, rather than we are sending that water again to the ground so that it could be reheated again by the rocks around it and which could be drawn to the surface to use towards different applications. So water is not getting wasted here rather than it's getting reused. Um, and GHG emissions are lower in case of geothermal energy because we are not like depleting any renewable energy sources, but rather than we are only like um, using green and renewable energy sources to use towards different applications. Um, I would not say like geothermal carries 0% emissions, but I would say in comparison to propane or like conventional fuels like natural gas or propane, it has lower GHG emissions. Uh, with that being said, what is the carbon footprint of low, of the geothermal energy? Um, we can look at this diagram. So as I mentioned before, in terms of solar and in terms of wind energy, we have to um, lie down like acres of like panels. We are lying down and we have to use like 4,300 40, 40, of acres uh, to use up the space. And in terms of wind onshore, this goes same like conditions. We have to use ample of space. But in terms of geothermal, it's very low. Like carbon footprint is very low in comparison to another technologies. As we can see, um, like based on acres of land for just producing one gigawatt, this much energy is being used or like land is being used uh, for different technologies. So with that being said, what is the what is the cost and economic side of geothermal? Like how much is gonna cost if I want to install a geothermal system at my place? Um, installation cost of, unfortunately, it's, it's going to be very, very high because um, drilling cost with the geothermal energy is very high. It, it can cost around $1,000 per meter and it's gonna cost like million dollars per one kilometer. So the range cost is very high, but excluding like piping, pipelines and pumps and heat exchangers, that is excluding the cost of drilling. So all of that cost, like laying down construction lines and making infrastructure and then drilling the area um, to get geothermal gradient and all those things is gonna cost higher at the start, at the beginning of the project. But I would say as the, as the project like progress, slowly so it's gonna cost less and less as it as has like operational maintenance cost less um so for example if aquaculture has has um year-round idle demand which means they are consuming energy same at the same time for the whole year so they are perfect customer for geothermal energy and they can get better success at it and they can sustain project like more efficiently and these kind of projects have longer lifespans i would say payback period uh cost around like 12 to 20 years and it all depends on this it all depends on like how um how efficient the project is and how significant uh, potential that project carries and how much is the like energy demand of that facilities and goes to evaluation, like all the surveys and geological assessments and, you know, mapping down the data and then mapping down uh, geothermal gradient and 80% goes to delivery, which means um, laying down the construction lines and having like pipelines uh, construction and then heating exchanges, heat exchangers uh, construction and all those things like integration the energy network system and five percent goes to permitting which means like getting permission from province and municipalities and five percent goes on designing the the whole project 
So that is how we can break down the cost into different um, categories. With that being said, uh, moving on to the next slide, we have a we have the evaluated map, which is this study has been done based on um, Nova Scotia's uh, Department of Natural Resources and Renewables in partnership with Net Zero Atlantic. So this map generally focuses on like different areas of the province that has been evaluated in terms of geothermal. Um, different shades of like this map shows different uh, potential of it. So as we can see, like darker purple color showcases higher potential, which means from the reference table, we can see um, the mid temperature that is ranging from greater than like 60 degrees Celsius. If we drill down to uh, three kilometers or more than that, we can get 60 degrees Celsius or more than that temperature. If we come towards like middle shade of the purple, which is focusing K Britain area, which showcases like three dots here, um, the yellow dot and the green dots, which is showcasing like 20 to 25 degrees Celsius per kilometer. And if we go like beyond three kilometers, we can get somewhere around 20 to 60 degrees Celsius, which is pretty good range for, for the mid-depth geothermal potential project. Um, so that is our major project focus of this um, GeoCAT pro project which is to like look on the mid-depth potential of Cape Britain. And moving on towards the next slide, we have some existing projects that we can take a reference from. We have Spring Hill Mine. Maybe some of you already aware of this project. This is the Nova Scotia's first project of like mine water heating energy. And they have, it was in 1994 they have established this project um they have abandoned mines they are using it towards uh heating up the school that is laying behind this park and they have different businesses around it i think they have a restaurant and a, and another businesses that is getting use of geothermal energy from this mine mine water heating system and this capacity is around like 400000 meter of mine and the temperature that was retrieved at the surface was 18 degrees Celsius, which is pretty good range for um, for heating up the space or use it to district heating and uh, district cooling. Um, moving on towards the next slide. So like looking at existing projects, we can similarly model same kind of projects in Cape Britain all over the areas. We have different examples. Um, we have different areas where we can look on. If we, um, can you, um, Chris, can you press enter like three times? Yeah. So we have like member two sports area, which is containing like 100,000 feet square of area, which is like they have walking space and an ice ring system, which they are using like geothermal potential for, for making ice. And during the ice making process, they like deplete um, heating energy, which is getting stored with the geothermal energy. So the main like learning point from member two space area is they are using it towards like different applications for for heating up like um, sports center and for, for ice making system. So for heating up the schools and for heating up the sports area. So like different applications could be drawn from like geothermal systems. And we have Canadian Coast Guard College and they are using seawater pump, which is liquid source heat pump um, for heating up the space inside their sports center. This is pretty amazing, like energy efficient technology they are using. I think they have upgraded with the different fan coil units and upgraded with energy efficient technologies to make it towards like a net zero building structure. And uh, like liquid source heat pump works similar to geothermal system, but they're not actually geothermal system, but the technology works similar to it. And the third third example is Portrotech greenhouse, which means uh, First Nation community greenhouse. They are using climate batteries and um, inbuilt um, ground geothermal system, which works similar to geothermal, which is like their small scale geothermal system. Um, 
the the work procedure is during the daytime they store heating energy into it and during the nighttime they distribute energy to the greenhouse space for like heating up the crops and everything so we, we have a like similar type of concept that's already existing in Caberton and the concept here is like we can we can build similar concepts like projects in Caberton that has geothermal potential so we have a list of all the facilities that are using geothermal already you guys also can like contact these centers and ask them if they have like um if you have any concerns if you want to like learn more about geothermal technology so these is centers already already using geothermal potential um moving on towards conclusion so as i mentioned geothermal energy is significant potential in k britain as it's renewable it's it's reliable it's 24 by 7 available and independent of external factors and as we looked over the map um, so K Britain areas that carries like mid-depth geothermal potential, which means uh, temperature lies in between like 20 to 60 degrees Celsius. And it could be used towards different applications like greenhouses and ice ring system and district heating and spas and aquacultures. So also considering Nova Scotia has a, has a coal mining history, um, we looked over Spring Hill Mine Project, which which means like they are using mine water heating. Um, and similar kind of projects could be developed here if we if we if we like reassess them, if we reassess their resources and if we analyze it further. Uh, so many opportunities could be drawn and so many like projects could be developed with the help of resources and like tools that we have in, in the province and different applications could be drawn from it. With that being said, um, as I mentioned, like project has higher installation cost, but it does have like lower operational cost as well. So if we want to make cost-effective solution, we should um, sell geothermal to like aquacultures, which because they have ideal energy demand and it could be used toward different applications as well. Um, yeah, as as I said, like um, further assessment at the provincial level is needed, is required if you want to make sure like the project is viable and commercially feasible. Um, yeah, moving on towards the next slide, we have um, Net Zero Atlantic's information site. If anybody has any questions or concerns, they can put in the chat box. Um, they can reach out to me after the presentation if they have any questions or feedback or any suggestions, how we can improve the project and how we can, if they have any like potential stakeholder connection or project developer connections, they can reach out to me. Um, I will be further a contact person and yeah. Thanks for listening to the session. I will be going over the questions if somebody has any concerns, feedback, questions, comments. Thanks very much, Rupinu. That was awesome. Very informative. Thanks. Um, I have some questions prepared, but Emily, if there's any that have come up in the chat, um, feel free to read them out. Um, anyone has questions coming up right now, you can raise your hand or, or enter them in the chat. One thing I wanted to clarify. Um, so people probably hear about like, you know, Iceland, runs on a lot of geothermal they actually have like the the kind of heat resource they can run steam plants to make electricity so we're not talking about using that technology in Nova Scotia right we're just using low level heat to provide heating yeah. services yeah um but even that even if we can't make electricity directly from geothermal 
mm-hmm. are still like taking away any heating demand from other heating sources is valuable anyway, I would think. Like a lot of homes and buildings are run on natural gas or, or even oil furnaces. Even the ones that are run on electricity, which is you know more efficient usually, um, using heat pumps, even if we can displace those, it's taking like a very important load off of the grid, especially yeah. as you know, as we're using more and more electric vehicles, like much more electrical demand anyway, we really try and electrify everything. So if we can take away some of the heating demand, like electricity loads skyrocket in winter when people are heating. So we take away some of that with geothermal, that's gonna be like very beneficial for emissions and for the electricity grid, I would think. Yeah, because as I mentioned, like geothermal carries a lot of like um, use cases with it, like and benefits with it. It has lower greenhouse gas emissions as comparison to propane and natural gas. So that's a good side of geothermal. And also um, the carbon footprint is very lower in case of geothermal. So we don't have to worry about like acres of lands. Um, and also... Like I think with the integration system technology, geothermal could play a significant role because if we want to like make it a secondary um, in the loop, uh, geothermal, so that could be another open area for geothermal. Like for example, if a, if we if you if I want to run a boiler, um, I can integrate it with the geothermal system and we can use it as a backup and not like relying completely on the geothermal system. So that being said, we are not like saying geothermal is the only technology that is existing in the world, but rather than we are just like balancing the energy load with it. So you said it's it's not zero emission, it's low emission. Yeah. Is the emission just coming from like the construction process or is there actual operational emissions? Yeah, during the whole like project progress, um, whether in terms of transportation and mobilization of equipments and drilling, and yeah, with that like vehicle transmissions. So I'm just curious. as well uh, in the operation process as well. Uh, it it honestly it will depend on how it's operated, but. Uh, with the operation of the pumps, for instance, um, if you have a fully electric grid, then there's no emissions. But if, as is the case in Nova Scotia, your electricity is to derive from fossil fuels, then it, it does have an output through that too. Okay, so like upstream emissions. I do have a couple of questions from the chat. Um, this one comes from Alan. Um, <clears throat> How easy is it to determine good geothermal sites? I'd love to see a lot more of this in BC. I think Joe can answer to that question. Yeah, I can definitely answer that. Um, so as far as looking for good geothermal sites, um, there's, there's several steps that you have to take. First off, I'll, I'll say that BC does have a number of sites and, and there are some geothermal projects that are ongoing in BC uh, in various areas. But one that comes to mind is way up in Northern BC in Fort Nelson, um, using existing oil and gas wells for electricity generation actually. Given, um, I, I'm not a geologist, but given where BC is and, and sort of there's a lot more hot springs and there's a lot more heat below the earth in some places, so you you can generate electricity. Um, but yeah, generally, you need to have a good understanding of the geology in the area. The geothermal projects that we're looking into in Nova Scotia are looking at uh, tapping into water deep below the ground in sedimentary rock, uh, where so you can access this water. Um, so you want to be sure that one, the rock type is suitable, and then two, that the water flow beneath the ground will be sufficient, that the reservoir will recharge itself as you're drawing water up and then re-injecting it uh, somewhere else in the reservoir. Um, so it's a costly process. It involves um, geophysical modeling in which uh, 
from the surface, you're looking at the ground and the geology and the hydrogeology. But uh, where it gets really costly is you need to drill test wells as well. There's really no substitute for that. Uh, and that will give you a better idea of the geothermal gradient in the area and um, the water recharge rate as well before you can really jump into a project. Thanks, Joe. That's a good segue into this next question from Charlene, um, who's wondering, although water drawn up from aquifers is reused, has there been any problems with decreasing water resources in aquifers? Or is that only a problem in areas with high use of aquifers for irrigation, for example? Yeah, that is a good kind of follow up question to that. Um, an important distinction to make is uh, talking about drawing up borders from aquifers, and we can often think about using aquifers for, for groundwater. Um, some people may be using wells and things like that, and that may absolutely be the case for um, smaller scale residential um, projects such as ground source heat pumps uh, and things like that where, where you're not going too deep below the earth. When we're talking about um, say mid-depth geothermal and we're, we're talking ranges of like one to three kilometers below the earth, um, that's as someone else has termed it, ancient water. It's got a lot of dissolved uh, minerals and heavy metals in it as well and it's not safe for drinking. Um, however, to the second point of that question, uh, can there be an issue with uh, decreasing water resources in aquifers? Yes, there absolutely can be. Um, the main, this is where you need to see um, like very strong uh, hydrogeolo hydrogeological expertise um, in the assessment of a project. You basically want to make sure that if you are drawing water up from one reservoir in the ground, when you're re-injecting it, it's going into the same reservoir. And that can be very difficult to tell. Um, but if you have experts who have proven experience with this, then, then it makes it easier. But nonetheless, it is a risk. Where Cape Breton has a few coal power plants, um, like I know you can, if you can preheat the water before you burn coal to boil the water, you increase the efficiency of the plant. You don't have to burn as much coal per unit electricity. But so like I know some plants, they'll actually use the exhaust fumes to preheat the water. Is there any potential to use Geothermal, you can heat water up to 60 degrees before it goes into a power plant. Can you increase the coal plant efficiency? Maybe it's a moot point now. We're getting off coal by 2030 anyway, but this is an idea that popped up as you were presenting. It's a really cool idea. I, I actually, when I started on this project, I had the same thought as well. Um, my understanding is that the I, I still don't quite get it, but uh, an engineer described it to me as it, it's quite efficient to sort of heat the water up with the existing processes. Uh, utilizing geothermal, it, it wouldn't be the most sort of resource efficient way of of heating up, yeah, for, for like a steam cycle for, for generating electricity. I'm a little fuzzy on, on why, um, but but yeah. Rupinda, did you have anything on that? Yeah, I think I'll just add to that point. Um, this this point comes up why when we see geothermal application in terms of industrial uses. Um, I think the factor to that is it's with the cost of um, drilling deeper to get higher temperature. Um, because like when we have to use it like for the industrial purpose, we have to um, drill deeper and deeper. And with that, we have to use deep geothermal systems. So it comes with the cost. Um, and that's why like most industries, they they like, um, they hinder to consider this project because they see like it's a highly costly project. Okay, that makes sense. 
um, your your map that you showed of the resource, was that sort of like the main outcome of the GeoCat project was producing that map? That it was done in 2020. So okay. this map was evaluated by DNRR, which is Department of Natural Resources and Renewables in partnership with Natural Atlantic. So they, they evaluated like every area of the province in terms of geothermal potential. Yeah, it seemed like there were a lot of like dark purple areas around like Cumberland County, Pictou County, Hans County. So are there other yeah. projects following up on, on those regions as well, in addition to Cape Breton? Yeah, we have seven community leads as me. Um, they are working on Cumberland County and Pictou County. And we have few of them working on um, um, Mabu and Inverness area, and me specifically working on Cape Breton. Um, yeah, yeah, we have work being done there, yeah. Okay. So is, is anyone gonna look at like how much um, like heating demand could potentially be displaced by geothermal in an economic way? Is that like a, a later stage of the project actually looking at what could be the GHG reduction potential of, of all these potential geothermal projects? I would say we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, right now, yeah, heating demand is is certainly the, the, the biggest sort of draw for, for geothermal, but I think we're really, where we're at in Nova Scotia, although there are sort of smaller ground source heat pump projects um, at like local facility, facilities, as Rupinda mentioned, and in many people's homes across the province, when it look when we look at say mid depth geothermal heating, it's it's really difficult to gauge uh, how much heating demand it could displace, um, just because the customer demand is so closely linked to it. Um, geothermal projects have to be fairly close to the customer that they're using, and because they're fairly uh, large in scope, especially at the the mid depth, um, you need a fairly large customer, whether it's say a housing development or a large industry. Um, so I, I'd say we're not quite there in terms of saying like the chunk of the province's heat that geothermal could displace, but uh, looking at it for individual customers where there could be a real use case, say they're in one of those dark purple areas on the map is, is where we're at. Okay, I understand. Um, there was one, I, I don't know if it really qualifies geothermal, but there was one really cool project in HRM that wasn't on your slide that I thought I might bring up. Maybe you do know about it. Um, at Alderney Landing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they use, I got to tour this site at some point in my engineering degree, I think. Um, but they use seawater from Halifax Harbor to cool a freshwater loop. And then the freshwater loop cools down the rocks underneath the parking lot in Alderney Landing in the summer, in the wintertime. And then those cold rocks are used as cold energy storage to heat or to cool of an air conditioning loop in the summer months, I believe. So I think it was like the first project of that type in the world where they actually use underground cold storage. Um, so I don't know if that counts as geothermal because it's not really using natural underground heat, but it is using like a ground heat sink, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Very. It's it's the same principle, and um, yeah, using using ocean boreholes instead. Uh, I think the Bedford Institute of Oceanography uh, has a similar system as well. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's particularly cool for an area like Halifax, where we don't really have that uh, those sedimentary aquifers sort of on the on the bedrock here. Um, but there is the ocean there, so it's it's a really great um, smart way of using the resources that are available to us. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so in the in the, in the member to center, they are using like geothermal for the hot uh, heating energy storage um, for ice ring system. So like somewhere geothermal, they use it like for distributing heat energy, somewhere they're using it as, as a sink 
um, for storing heat energy inside it. So Rapinder, your, your presentation included, I think the term like seawater source heat pump or something. Yeah. So does that yeah. like a subcategory of geothermal or is that a different category entirely? So they work on a similar principle, but they are not fully like geothermal systems. So Canadian Coast Guard College, they're using seawater pump, like based on like liquid source heat pump. Um, they're drawing up like seawater to, um, to like heat up the space inside their sports center. And they, they integrate it with the like different other like fan unit and energy drives and fan drives. So it's integrated technology. It's it's like not fully geothermal, but it, they work it like similar to geothermal. Okay. And I did get to, uh... I did my master's with a Surrett Battery Company in Spring Hill. So I spent a lot of time in their factory and they, got, they showed me how they do like the, some of that mine water gets used for, for their heating process. It was pretty cool. Um, so I got to ask all my questions. <laughs> so I see there's a new one in the chat here. Um, Aaron asks, there are two other buildings in Halifax using the same technology as the Coast Guard, College, Queensmark, and NSP headquarters. Yeah, yeah, I was reading about those today. Um, yeah, because I knew, I couldn't remember which spot it was in, in HRM that used the actual underground storage. Um, so I was reading about the Amera headquarters and Queensmark, the new one, they use seawater just to, I think, uh, preheat their like heat pumps in the winter and cool for air conditioning in the summer. Um, so there's no storage underground component of it, but similar to the, the Coast Guard College, yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments from anybody? We're pretty much right on time here anyway. I had a lot of fun, learned a lot. Thanks a lot, Rupinder and Joe. Um, Thank you. And thanks everyone who attended. Your thanks, participation. And I think so. Uh, we need to add, as somebody mentioned in the chat box, there's a new waterfall, new Victoria mine water treatment plant that we need to add on the list. Oh, so yeah. thanks for the suggestion. I will look into it. So the recording for, for tonight's webinar will be emailed to everybody if you want to rewatch it, if you, if you missed anything or share it to anyone who you think would be interested. I will mention quickly that all of NSCN's core funding comes from membership dues and small individual donations. So those are the funds we use to, to hire staff and organize educational events like this one. We haven't had any staff on since February, which is why the board is conducting this particular webinar. Um, but we're hoping to have our next staff on for July. So it'll be a lot more coming, coming from us this summer. If you'd like to join a membership or donate or support us in any other way, please check out our website. Every contribution goes a long way. We really appreciate anything. Um, so with that, thanks everybody and good night.